Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. I am Noura Arafe, I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford, and I will be moderating today's policy uh, lab. Um, so, Ibrahim, Arab normalization has been ongoing for a long period of time and has especially gained momentum recently under the Trump administration. In your opinion, what have been the drivers of Arab normalization with Israel historically and at the present? And how have the aspects of Arab normalization evolved over time? Uh, thank you, Noor, and thanks uh, to Al Shabaka for hosting this uh, timely and important uh, the policy lab discussion about uh, this uh, serious uh, development in the region uh, and uh, the uh, Arab Israeli conflict. Uh, let me begin with uh, looking at uh, uh, two different paradigms, the way I'm seeing this, in terms when we talk about the causes uh, uh, of Arab normalization and the nature of uh, normalization process that's taking place at the, uh, at the time. Historically, uh, since you asked about the history, historically we had uh, two peace agreements uh, between uh, Israel and Arab countries, uh, Jordan and uh, Egypt. Uh, and the model or the paradigm at the time it was uh, for the first two uh, cases of Arab normalization was driven by uh, uh, this principle of uh, peace for land. You know, there is an occupied Arab land by Israel in 1967 war, and uh, there is a state of war between Israel and the neighboring countries. And uh, in uh, 1978, uh, Egypt reached an understanding, a peace agreement, Camp David agreement with Israel, you know, that would, uh, for Israel to uh, withdraw from the uh, occupied Sinai, uh, and for a uh, peace agreement or peace treaty with, between Egypt and, uh, and Israel. In 1994, a uh, sim similar thing happened with Jordan and, uh, uh, and Israel, uh, another peace treaty based on the same model, land for peace, uh, which is basically uh, withdrawing from the uh, occupied uh, Jordanian land as well. And of course, the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel was driven by uh, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace accord or Oslo accord done in 1993, uh, which also is built on the same model, which is basically an, uh, a withdrawal from uh, the 1967 uh, occupied Palestinian land uh, for uh, recognition uh, of, of Israel. In 2002, we had the Arab Peace Initiative uh, that emphasized the same exact paradigm, which is basically uh, in the Arab League summit in Beirut, offered uh, Saudi Arabia offered an initiative, uh, which is called again the, the Arab Peace Initiative for a full withdrawal uh, of occupied Arab land uh, by Israel for a full normalization of all 23 Arab countries, basically ending the state of war between Israel and all Arab countries for the return of 1967 borders. So since 2002, this is the paradigm also that continued to drive uh, Arab peace talks, right? For the first time, now we're seeing a new paradigm is being born, uh, which is basically by United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, that A, they're not neighboring countries of uh, Israel, B, uh, they don't have uh, an occupied Emirati or Bahraini land uh, by Israel, uh, and three, they've never been uh, in war with, with Israel, like again Jordan and uh, Egypt in the past. So this is, we're seeing a whole new model that's again being built, which is basically, uh, I'm not uh, a big fan of the term normalization, because again, normalization happens between two parties that are in a state of war, and then they decide to end the state of war and engage in normalizing their relationships. A, or one, uh, UAE and Bahrain and other Arab countries, not the only two countries, had had relationships between, you know, with Israel in the past 20 years. Like, this is one of the statements made by uh, Yedaot Ahranot's uh, chief editor saying that we had this relationship for the past 20 years 
And what happened is that we just, you know, took it to another level, is to go public, right? So uh, again, the relationship uh, ex did exist before, but now we're seeing a whole new thing. Now, what is the nature of this new paradigm is basically, uh, it's not normalization, as I said, it's more of um, an alliance, an alliance between uh, UAE, Bahrain, and Israel, which has a very clear or specific agenda between the two parties. Uh, and at the core of this agenda, one is that confronting Iran, uh, two, which also emerged recently, confronting Turkey or the Turkish influence, because Turkey's influence is also expanding in the region, uh, in Libya. There is some sort of also a proxy uh, conflict between UAE on one side with Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and Turkey and Libya and Qatar is on the other side uh, in Libya. So, uh, and Israel definitely has tense relationship with Turkey at the, uh, at the time. So, we have Iran, we have also Turkey is being added to this, but also there are other important uh, points on the agenda that drive this alliance, which is uh, part of the declared or of the open UAE regional policy is to reshape the politics or the, to reshape the political map uh, of the Middle East, which uh, when we talk about reshaping the political map of uh, the Middle East means uh, uh, for the UAE, the way it is declared publicly and openly, fighting political Islam. And here by political Islam, I'm not referring necessarily to ISIS or, or other uh, uh, radical groups, but mainstream political Islam like the Muslim Brotherhood. Right? And two, uh, also at the core of this uh, regional agenda for the UAE is ending the calls for change and democratization and uh, accountability and uh, you know the, the slogans or the principles were advocated or pursued uh, you know by the arab spring revolutions basically is that uh, for the uae uh, is launching or leading or leading um, a counter revolution along with saudi arabia and egypt uh, in order to end these calls or arab spring revolutions and they try to restore the old regional system about basically dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, uh, which is basically is to put an end to the uh, calls for change and democratization in the Middle East. One last point, uh, uh, if you can, if you give me one more minute, why this is happening now, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because the timing is, in my view, is very critical, is very important. And in my view, I think uh, a major reason behind the timing that's happening now is that very simple and very clear. We're only almost two months away from uh, someone else being will be in the White House or the same person, Donald Trump, continuing in the White House. Now, as you know, is that uh, polls in the United States, you know, showing that Joe Biden is taking the lead in, uh, in most polls in the, in the U.S. at the moment. And there is a serious risk for them, for the UAE and Israel, by the way, because also Israel uh, had a, very, a relatively uh, tough relationship with uh, Obama when he was in, in office. Uh, so there is a risk of the Democrats coming back to the White House in November. So in order to, uh, because of this, again, rest or because of this concern on the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Israel on the same, on the, on one, on, on, on that side, there is this tendency or the, this uh, uh, cause or this, uh, you know, factor is that they try to set up the arrangement for them or for the alliance to continue without Donald Trump if Joe Biden comes back to the White House. And not only this, but also to be able to influence the White House uh, because of this alliance between Israel, U uh, Saudi Arabia, and UAE. So you have uh, regional players, right? And this is also made openly and publicly by uh, uh, the UAE ambassador in Washington, D.C., al Taiba, saying openly again and, uh, that uh, is to shape uh, or to influence the White House, the U.S. government to shape the politics of the Middle East. So I think that's that played a, uh, an important and a relevant factor 
is for this new paradigm of an alliance, not a normalization uh, that's happening unlike the way it is being used. And for that, I think we're seeing this uh, being done now is to make the arrangements again before the U.S. elections in early November. Thank you, Ibrahim, for giving us this insightful uh, perspective into uh, the recent uh, developments. Um, many Palestinian officials described the UAE and Bahrain's deal with Israel as a stab in the back or as a betrayal of Palestinians within a larger framework of the so-called regional peace that has been dictated by the Trump administration. But there has been very limited analysis of the actual impact of recent Arab normalization on the Palestinian uh, cause. So I'd like to ask both of you, Tare and Ibrahim, about what you think is the impact and the different ramifications of recent Arab normalization on Palestinians and their struggle for, uh, for freedom. Tare, can I start with you? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, Shabaka, for, for hosting this timely webinar. And thank you, Brahim, for your, for your insights in beginning this. So I'm going to make three main points. I'm going to talk about the immediate implications of uh, the new alliance, as Ibrahim is calling it. I'm going to talk a bit about the longer term implications, and then I want to talk about the regional implications. So in terms of the immediate implications of this, <clears throat> The, the very clear implication is that the Palestinians are more diplomatically isolated and vulnerable than they had been before these deals took place. That's not to say that uh, there had never been a kind of a betrayal uh, or a kind of co-optation by Arab regimes of the Palestinian cause. Historically, uh, from the days of the PLO being established onwards, there had always been uh, a, a double politics that was happening, where the, uh, the Palestinian revolution would look for its Arab depth and its uh, alliances in the region, while at the same time, Arab regimes would co-opt the Palestinian struggle, uh, both to deflect from their own internal issues, but also in order to uh, strengthen uh, their hold uh, on, on their regimes and on the region. So there's always been an un, uh, a, a difficult uh, relationship between the Palestinian movement and the Arab regimes. Uh, what happened, however, uh, in the Arab Peace Initiative, which uh, Brahim spoke about, is that there was uh, a, at least a, a formalization of an Arab position around the land for peace model. Uh, the Arab League, through the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, provided Palestinians with some level of diplomatic cover and with some level of support uh, on the international stage. With these deals happening now, the Arab Peace Initiative is disintegrating in terms of its uh, impact to uh, give the Palestinians the political and the diplomatic leverage they need. So I think the most immediate implications of those deals is the fact that the Palestinians are now more vulnerable than they had been before it. Uh, even, as I said, taking into context how effective the, the Arab Front was, um, even with that caveat, uh, nonetheless, the, the collapse of the Arab Peace Initiative in the way we understand it leaves Palestinians more vulnerable to whatever policies that the U.S. administration, the current one or the next one, is putting forward. So that's sort of the first point that I want to make in terms of the immediate implications. The longer term implications have to do with the uh, reversal of the paradigm that Ibrahim spoke about. The Arab Peace Initiative and certainly the different uh, peace treaties that happened between Jordan and Egypt and Israel all uh, were based on a land for peace model, uh, which meant that there was a concession that was uh, expected from the Israelis, uh, which was to withdraw from occupied Palestinian territories in uh, in return for a stronger, a stronger or normalized relationship with Arab regimes. Now, uh, the paradigm is a peace for peace paradigm, where uh, the Arab regimes actually pursue peace with Israel, not based on it ending the occupation, but only because they want to make peace with Israel for its economic power, for its diplomatic power, for its military power, uh, for access into the White House. So all of those factors remove the, uh, the need or the pressure on Israel to relinquish Palestinian land. Now, the longer term implication of that is that the Palestinian statehood project, as it's understood today, as rooted in the Oslo Accords, 
no longer necessarily holds. This is a significant blow to the idea that peace with Israel will come through Israel relinquishing its hold on uh, Palestinian lands. The idea that now even the Arab states have accepted for this model to be shaped or reshaped or inverted, I should say, means that the Palestinians are in a position where they have to question uh, whether a project that they had dedicated themselves to for the past three decades uh, is working. I think that what we see now from this new alliance that is emerging is that the Palestinians are, uh, as I said, more isolated, but also uh, it's less likely that their statehood project, uh, which they have committed to, uh, is working. Now, this uh, longer term implication uh, is both negative and positive. Uh, obviously, the positive side is that it shows that a long-awaited uh, renewal is needed. So it shows that the performance of statehood and sovereignty uh, by the Palestinian leadership now needs to be revisited. There's no longer uh, the, the fig leaf, I should say, or the facade of statehood has, has been removed in a very um, uh, powerful way, even though many would argue it's been removed for some time. So the positive here is that this is a call for renewal. The negative, of course, is that the Palestinian leadership is unclear on how it's going to use this opportunity. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in, in the next line of questions. Uh, the third point that I want to make is on the regional implications. And here, there's, uh, there's again, immediate implications and longer term implications. The immediate implications, Ibrahim touched on some of them. Uh, the first is that political Islam is now uh, more isolated and more under threat than before. And this has immediate implications on Hamas and Hamas's uh, situation in the Gaza Strip. Uh, what is the UAE's policy here? How will it uh, impact the way that Qatar gets involved in the Gaza Strip? Is there stronger pressure uh, against Qatar's involvement, a stronger support of Israeli attacks against the Gaza Strip? Those are all uh, immediate implications. And the second immediate implication, of course, is uh, the fact that the new alliance that's emerging in the Middle East, uh, the way that I think about it is that the counter-revolution is getting formalized now. This counter-revolution is a securitized one that's based on uh, intelligence sharing with the Israelis. It's based on despotic regimes gaining hold. Um, and obviously, this has implications on the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian authority. What kind of alliances are they forming? Are they going to become... Uh, Counter revolution, or are they going to go back into their revolutionary roots, which are, of course, threatening to the Arab regimes elsewhere? The longer term implications, uh, and I'll leave this as a sort of a question for, for some of the uh, discussion that we'll have later about the way forward for Palestinians, is that now the Palestinians are stuck between their history of being a revolutionary movement that's rooted in a popular struggle, that's rooted in the people, uh, that aligns itself with the people of the Arab world, uh, and between a leadership that has become more authoritarian, uh, uh, more set in its ways, more focused on performances of, of statehood and state building and more naturally allied with some of the authoritarian regimes in the region. And this these, uh, this new alliance or these normalization deals is showing very, very clearly that juncture. Thank you so much, uh, Tariq. Uh, Rahim, what's your take on the impact of uh, what you call this recent alliance uh, between um, the UAE, Bahrain and Israel on the Palestinian cause? Thank you. I think Tariq uh, mentioned very important points here about the implication. I agree with him totally. Uh, let me focus on other things uh, just to build on what Tariq uh, mentioned. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, this uh, alliance uh, has serious implications for the uh, Palestinian cause. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the legitimization of the occupation in the eyes of the, you know, of some Arab countries. Basically, two Arab countries accepting the status quo of Israel being in control of East Jerusalem and the West Bank and, and so forth. So at the time where the world and the, you know, is uh, developing uh, response to the Israeli occupation and the apartheid regime, uh, being, uh, you know, in, uh, in the Palestinian territories, boycotting Israel and pressuring Israel to uh, stop the discrimination against the Palestinians there. We're seeing two Arab countries that are uh, em uh, embracing uh, this and building a relationship or legitimizing uh, 
the Israeli control and the apartheid system it maintains in, in Palestine. The other major uh, impact, uh, in my view, we in conflict resolution pay close at attention to the balance of power and its relationship to uh, peace building and achieving peace. And I think, you know, what this happens is that Arab Palestinians lost major supporters, uh, like uh, uh, two key Arab countries, uh, you know, in this uh, conflict with the Palestinian, which what this does, um, in fact, is further uh, imbalancing the already imbalanced relationship between uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis, which makes it, uh, you know, which uh, you know, poses the question is that what would incentivize Israel now to engage in, um, in peace, uh, in peace building and in ending this conflict? Because this was part of the idea of the Arab Peace Initiative, build peace, the engage with peace with everyone and then you know you have the markets the arab markets and everything is open for you now if israel gets this what would then incentivize israel to engage in serious peace? but nevertheless because again of this power relationship and the imbalancing of the imbalanced relationship or the asymmetric relationship between the palestinian and israelis i think uh, this presents a serious and a unique opportunity for the Palestinians as a wake-up call. The Palestinians have been, uh, uh, have been living in this um, illusion about the Oslo uh, agreement or the Oslo Accord achieving a peaceful uh, solution to the conflict with Israel and engaging in uh, futile negotiations, pointless, useless negotiations. Since 1993, until the uh, until now is that thinking that you know the uh, negotiations and uh, the quartet and supported by the united states and russia and all of that that would give them a step and end of occupation enough stop this this is not getting you anywhere this is you're you're only living in a uh, you know in an illusion this is not going to happen so this is a wake-up call is that the arab peace initiative for the Palestinians, it's no longer the driving paradigm that for peaceful negotiations that Israel believes in. Israel does not believe uh, in the Arab Peace uh, uh, Initiative, does not believe in this negotiation. So I think this uh, throws you know, the ball in the court of the Palestinians. It's a wake up call. You yourself need to address the power relations with Israel. Power is not only nuclear weapons. Power is international solidarity. Power is your moral power, is your ethical uh, principles about the freedom, justice, peace. This is what the Palestinians stand for. Right? They don't have to have nuclear capabilities in order to fight Israel or to confront Israel. The apartheid in South Africa did not collapse because the black community uh, earned or possessed nuclear weapons. So the Palestinians have a lot that they can do. And I think this peace, tree, this peace or normalization or alliance between UAE, Bahrain and Israel, call it whatever you want to call it, is a liberating force, should be. Should be mm -hmm. a liberating mechanism for the Palestinians is to wake up and not to, not to continue to be delusioned about uh, the possibility of achieving uh, peace, uh, you know, through this model. So I think uh, the opportunity is there and uh, this could be, or the Palestinians, if they perform well, this could be turned from a threat to opportunity. And it's the Palestinian calls is to try to convert it to an opportunity. And I think the potential does exist for this and the Palestinians must grab this opportunity because if you allow me one last thing, uh, Noor, I know uh, you want me to finish on this, uh, because over the past also uh, decades uh, of the Palestinian being supported financially by Arab countries, this this also for the Palestinian became developed an, an attitude of also of, of dependency, right, of the Palestinian leadership, I mean, the Palestinian uh, authority is that to depend on the financial support coming from Arab countries. It also developed uh, a sense of entitlement within the Palestinian leadership. We're entitled to this. No, you have to do your work. You have to do your job as the Palestinian leadership. 
in order to be able to make difference. And this should be a liberating from this uh, a liberating mechanism, you know, from this uh, illusion called about reaching peace or ending the occupation through negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ibrahim. I want us to build on what you just um, mentioned about what the Palestinian leadership uh, can do and should do. So basically, in response to uh, the agreement that was signed, Fatih and Hamas, they have been engaging in talks to restore unity and put an end to the division that has been, that dates back to 2007. They also agreed on a so-called unif unified food leadership that would lead popular resistance against the occupation, and they called on Palestinians to participate in demonstrations yesterday as part of what they called a day uh, of rage, or like a, uh, a day of popular uh, rejection. Tare, before we talk about what Palestinians should do, how would you assess the Palestinian response so far to, the, to these different efforts of Arab uh, countries normalizing their relations with Israel? <clears throat> Thanks, Noor. I mean, I would assess it as ineffective, uh, quite, quite uh, 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 frankly. I think that, uh, I, first of all, I want to say that I completely agree with everything that Rahim said. And I think this is a moment of opportunity, which so far the Palestinian leadership does not seem to be capable of grasping or even understanding it as a moment of opportunity. And I'll add one more point to what Ibrahim said. A apart from the Palestinian uh, lead leadership, I should say, having become uh, entitled and dependent, it's also become victimized uh, in the sense that it constantly plays up the idea that everything that is happening, whether it's the Trump plan, whether it's Israeli settlement expansion, whether it's military assaults on Gaza, are forcing it in a role of victimization, which of course it is, and they are, because the Palestinians are uh, colonized subjects in this case, and they are victims of Israeli colonization. But this uh, positioning also removes the idea of Palestinian agency of what Palestinians can do in order to respond. And the way that the Palestinian leadership so far has responded, the, the examples that you gave, Noor, really need to be understood in the context of how Palestinians have been responding for the past few years to the Trump attack on the Palestinian movement. This is in some ways a continuation of uh, those policies. And we've seen several ways, several attempts of trying to respond. We've seen um, attempts to take resolutions uh, at the UN Security Council or at the Arab League in order to condemn uh, the Trump actions or to condemn uh, the Arab uh, agreements. Um, we've seen attempts to end security coordination, uh, which have never gone to the level of what they promised to be. And we've seen attempts at unity which is before the one that you talked about now, uh, which is the unity around popular committees and the formation of this kind of struggle, there was, if you recall, before the, the prospective annexation date of July, a meeting between Hamas and Fatah that also tried to put forward a united front against annexation. So there's a, a, a performance that reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah is in the cards and that this will re-strengthen the Palestinians and, and pro uh, promote a united view uh, against all these attacks that are happening against the Palestinian movement. The problem with all of those initiatives, apart from the fact that diplomatically they fail to garner enough support, whether at the Arab League or at the UN Security Council, is that locally they still happen within the institutions uh, of governance that were defined by the Oslo Accords, whether we're thinking about security coordination or we're thinking about uh, unity between Hamas and Fatah within the bodies of the PA, within the body of the PA. All of those reactions are still taking place within the very accords that this new alliance and that the Trump administration, certainly the Israeli government under Netanyahu, has rendered meaningless. So it's that all of the actors around the Palestinians have broken out of that straitjacket, and it's only Palestinians who are defining the limits of their response within a, a, a political body that is focused on governance, not focused on liberation. So if all of their uh, actions are limited to what the limits of the PA are, uh, then they are already disenfranchised in how they can effectively respond to this. So uh, the, the 
you know, I, I know that uh, you want to talk a bit about the way forward, and Ibrahim talked about it uh, uh, as well a bit. I, I just want to make two quick points here. Is that the idea of popular uh, resistance and the idea that that popular resistance can be uh, rejuvenated by the factions from the top down, by a directive from the PA, fails to take into account the fact that the, uh, the PA itself, and in some ways the factions have lost legitimacy among the Palestinian people, and no longer represent the kind of uh, political uh, project or the kind of liberation struggle that the Palestinian people need or are calling for. And so the idea that that kind of day of rage is a sufficient response to what's happening is a really, is a, is a really a uh, tragic and dangerous misunderstanding of the situation that's happening now. The second is that over the course of the past three decades, all the institutions of liberation of the Palestinian people have become subsumed. Um, and, you know, I'm sure Ibrahim will talk about this in the way, uh, defining the way forward to uh, the need to go back to some kind of liberation struggle. We need to understand that the Palestinian as a people, as a revolutionary project, needs to be resuscitated. And here is where the opportunity that Brahim is talking about uh, presents itself. Because if we're looking at the alliance that's emerging now in the region, the regime, the, the alliance is happening between Arab regimes that are not representative and Israel. The Arab public is still supportive of the Palestinian struggle. And this is a card, a card of strength that the Palestinian leadership can use to talk about the balance of power to go back into a revolutionary movement, there's an Arab depth here that is underutilized and underappreciated. Uh, and so I think that the Palestinian leadership now is obviously blind to that fact or, fact or unwilling to use it because the current situation uh, serves it quite well. And so the way, way forward uh, is to break out of that, uh, out of that trouble. Thank you so much, Tare. Brahim, very quickly, because you mentioned in, the, in your last, um, uh, answer to one of my questions that what what's, what happened can be seen as an opportunity uh, for Palestinians. Can you elaborate on this? Uh, how can it be an opportunity and what more should Palestinians, in your opinion, do? Thank you, uh, Noran. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, yes, actually, the, the issue is building on this opportunity. And I believe the opportunity does exist. And for that, I am uh, I presented as a way forward, uh, you know, to respond to this development is what I call the fourth paradigm. Basically, there are when we talk about how the Palestinians should end the occupation and earn their freedom. Basically, there are three paradigms, existing paradigms that deal with this question. One is that the Palestinians historically played, which is the armed resistance, basically, that Fatah gave up and abandoned in 1993, but Hamas in Gaza today is still uh, holding to this and advancing an armed resistance, uh, uh, freedom through armed resistance. And the second paradigm, which is the Oslo Arab Peace Initiative, basically uh, an independent Palestinian state through negotiations. And there is a third paradigm, which is the, uh, the Donald Trump paradigm, which is called the uh, deal of the century, which is basically uh, for the Palestinian is a surrender, is that to accept the way unilaterally set by Benjamin Netanyahu uh, about uh, the end of the conflict, which is basically, again, a surrender and an apartheid, bantustat type of, of paradigm. None of this works for the Palestinian, right? Now, what should work and the Palestinians is that to work on the fourth paradigm, which is basically capitalizes on the uh, moral and ethical power of the Palestinian cause and the just cause of the Palestinians and building on, uh, you know, what's called the soft power paradigm, basically uh, building on their soft power combined with the popular resistance, which is also uh, Tariq mentioned. Now, soft power, the Palestinians cannot and will not be allowed to have solid power. So forget it. So the armed resistance is not going to work. Now, what they can work, and this is what, where they have the upper hand, right, on that when it comes to the conflict over Israel, which is the soft power model, is that the just cause of freedom and liberation and justice, you know, in, in this conflict. Now, with this taking it to the international community, I think they have a serious opportunity there. 
But again, as Joseph Nye defined, soft power by itself only doesn't work. Right? This has to be combined by some sort of a, a, a hard power, which is the hard power here, again, is the popular resistance, peaceful, nonviolent resistance that the Palestinian can raise. And, and this speaks actually to the comparative advantage of the, that the Palestinians have over the relationship with Israel. The Palestinians, there are 50% of the Palestinian population that they are, are in the diaspora. They are spread all over the, uh, uh, all, all over the world. And they can contribute uh, to the just and uh, you know, struggle of the, of the Palestinians. The armed resistance has been uh, a very exclusive uh, uh, excluding, you know, the majority of the Palestinians to engage in this. Negotiation is also in, uh, uh, excluding uh, the entire Palestinian society and restricted to the uh, Palestinian leadership. Now, popular resistance along with the soft power is a very inclusive power, is a very inclusive approach that allows the Palestinian in America, in Germany, in South Africa, in Asia, and in Palestine engage in this legitimate struggle, very similar to the South African uh, model, which is basically uh, now, you know, we have, you can, you know, fight for your struggle through the legal system all over the world, through universities, through the media, the think tanking. So again, uh, and this is where, again, the Palestinians have an upper hand over this, because this speaks to their power, uh, and their moral power. I think this is what the model uh, that works for the Palestinians now. And this is, again, that can, in my view, turn this into an opportunity by capitalizing on their soft power combined with uh, the legitimate uh, 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 you know, popular resistance within the framework of the international law where they can proceed and they can make a difference. Uh, and they don't need the UAE money. They don't need the Bahraini money. Uh, they can proceed on this and again turn this into opportunity if they do it. Thank you so much, Ibrahim and Tariq, for uh, your insights. We're going to move to the questions by the audience. I'm aware of the time, but um, hopefully we'll be able to address as many questions as we can. Um, Tariq, there's a question by David. Um, he's asking, does normalization with Israel make a strategy that is based on equal rights within a single state? more likely, what are the prospects that Abbas and the others will shift to the single state uh, strategy? That's a great question. I mean, I think that uh, they make it more likely just in as far as they show that the current uh, project of the Palestinian leadership is ineffective and vacuous and is a, is a further wake up call. I mean, I, I've, I've lost count of how many wake up calls we've had, but it's a further wake up call of the sense that the state will uh, project or the state building project uh, has failed. So in that sense, yes, it moves us closer to in that direction. But I think that when we think about uh, the, the idea of, you know, uh, equal rights in a single state, I think it's really important to understand what that means. It doesn't mean that we're looking to be uh, equal to Israeli Jews in the current reality. It means going through a process of decolonization. It means making sure that there's justice and that there's a, a process of um, a redistribution of structural uh, uh, historic grievances uh, that have uh, plagued the Palestinians for the past decades, right? So I don't think this is something that's going to come uh, through a negotiation process. I don't think it's something that's going to come through uh, the leadership or through the PA leadership now. It's a process that has to be revolutionary uh, in the sense that it needs to uh, be popular uh, and it needs to uh, uh, confront uh, the the sort of the, uh, the the Zionist colonization that's taken root uh, in the land of historic Palestine. I don't think the leadership uh, is capable of adjusting or moving in that way unless they talk and discuss the things that I mentioned before, which is to go back to the institutions of liberation, whether it's mm -hmm. that are focused on uh, confronting uh, a, a colonialist center. Thank you, uh, Tariq. 
Ibrahim, there's a question. Um, basically, how serious are the moves toward unity by the main Palestinian factions? How likely is this unity initiative to collapse once there are actual negative effects for those Palestinians who have benefited from the old years financially and uh, politically? What do you think about this? If early November we see Joe Biden uh, coming to the White House, then say goodbye to the Palestinian unity. And the reason for this is that uh, the Palestinians, uh, now what they're doing, they're trying to work around this uh, in order to uh, send an, uh, you know, a voice, because this has been a, a uniting force for the Palestinians. But because it treats uh, Fatah or the Palestinian Authority like Hamas, no difference. And the proposal that it's, uh, it's putting on the table of a surrender of the Palestinian, no one, no one Palestinian from any faction is going to accept this. But so they force actually a unity on the Palestinians as to, as in the last meeting uh, uh, a week ago by uh, all Palestinian factions two weeks ago, that they're trying to uh, promote uh, a unified approach. Once, if we see Trump is going uh, and is leaving the White House, and then Biden back to the office and saying, okay, we are happy to resume negotiations, immediately the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, right, is going to embrace this with open hands and continue to live with this delusion about, uh, you know, that this negotiation will um, earn the Palestinians an independence. And of course, Hamas is opposing to, to this, right? Because this will also mean that the Hamas, they have to uh, renounce violence and uh, accept all uh, agreements signed in the past, also, and offer them nothing, by the way, right? Because uh, I don't think Hamas is against uh, the two-state solution and the uh, 1967 uh, uh, boundaries. And Tariq uh, can correct me on this, uh, as he's the author of a book on Hamas. Uh, but, but Hamas is raising the question, why should I accept this model then, since I'm seeing it's getting Abbas and Fatah nothing? Right? Why should I embrace it? Right. So I think this is the major one major reason, again, why Hamas historically has been against negotiation, because the Fatah recognized Israel over 78 percent of the land, gave everything, but they got nothing. They got now what they're getting back is an apartheid model is to accept. So again, once we see Biden back and then there is a very small hint by the White House that we are happy to support negotiations and reopen the, uh, the House, the Palestinian uh, uh, embassy or representation office in Washington, D.C., resume some financial assistance, then you will see uh, Abbas joining and then back the Palestinian back to their uh, places. If Trump continues, I do think this unity will continue because, again, Trump and the deal of the century is forcing the Palestinians to be united. And I can assure you, Noor, now, at least, you know, in, you know, during my life, you will not find one Palestinian, regardless, right, from Hamas to Fatah to any faction you, you, that you can choose, will accept the deal of the century, the way it's proposed by Netanyahu and Donald Trump. So the Palestinian will remain united if Trump remains in office. That's the way I read. Thank you. Uh, Tariq, would you like to add anything on the... Uh, um the, the unity and its potential, or shall I ask you a different question? I mean, I just I, I would just say one thing, which is that I, I, I agree with what Ibrahim says, but I'm a bit uh, more skeptical about uh, uh, about the, the, the last point he made about the Trump deal. I do agree that there isn't a single Palestinian who would accept the Trump deal the way it's presented, but I think what might happen is that they will they might be forced into it. So the, the kind of opposition to the Trump deal will be so ineffective that regardless of what the Palestinian leadership or the unities is uh, defining that they will that this is a status quo that will be for, or a fait accompli I should say that is forced on them and I think the problem with the unity is that it's not coming within uh, a broader project of liberation that is taking agency and moving forward it's only reactive to what's being imposed on it and I think that's that's where it becomes problematic Thank you, um, Tariq. So we have like many questions, so I'm trying to uh, merge some questions because some questions are about the same topic. So Tariq, 
regarding we discussed the way uh, forward and there are a couple of questions on whether Palestinians should actually engage in negotiations with the state of Israel uh, so that we can reach the uh, achieve or accomplish to discuss basically the strategy of uh, merging two states into a single democratic state with equal uh, rights uh, for all. What do you think about this view that we that negotiation with Israel is in a way the only way forward uh, to shift the paradigm? I think it's important when we're thinking about this to think about a, a, a point that Ibrahim made earlier about the balance of power. There is absolutely not no, no good that can come out of Israelis and Palestinians negotiating anything at the moment. I think the balance of power is so vast between the two that regardless of what the Palestinian position is, it will be subsumed by an Israeli position, certainly one that is now backed by the UAE, Bahrain, and, and uh, the U.S. So I, I personally am against any form of negotiation between Palestinians and Israelis now. I think that what we need to be talking about is not negotiation with Israel, is uh, within the Palestinian community, how do we resuscitate a, rev a revolutionary project that changes this balance of power. So now this balance of power is so extreme. Uh, that gap can be closed if Palestinians are able to use uh, their strong points, including their moral legitimacy, as uh, Ibrahim said, but also their, their popular power, uh, and uh, learn from other anti-colonial and revolutionary movements, whether it's the anti-apartheid movement in the ANC or elsewhere, uh, how to balance power and how to close that gap with the Israelis, how to create a negotiating situation that will force the Israelis to start relinquishing some of the power that they have. I don't think we're there yet, and I would venture that we probably won't get there for a few decades yet, certainly not under the current leadership if they remain committed to their uh, status project. So in that sense, I think rather than negotiations, we really do need to think about liberation and decolonization. Thank you, Tyler. Um, of course, decolonization is such a term, so maybe we can do one pocket, but we don't have to time. Um, uh, Ibrahim, we have a couple of questions regarding uh, the fourth model that you suggested on Palestinians building um, a soft power and uh, drawing under the ethical and moral uh, power and legitimacy um, and the just cause they are fighting for. So the first question is, where does the leadership for the soft power come from? And the second question is, um, historically, uh, the soft power model didn't work for the Mufti in the 1940s. And, um, and uh, I think it was Ian uh, who actually uh, gave a reference to Yusuf Sayer, uh, also criticizing this model and um, arguing that it's, it, was, it was not enough uh, for Palestinians to uh, to uh, to simply rely on uh, the merit of uh, of the Palestinian people. How would you respond to these two questions? Well, I think they are really uh, really great questions and uh, very intellectually engaging about uh, this new uh, you know paradigm that I call the fourth paradigm. And I agree totally. And this is actually a major factor in uh, determining the success or the failure of the fourth paradigm which is, you know, who's going to lead this, right? Who's the leader of this? Definitely without an inspiring, legitimate leadership, this cannot work. I agree, you know, I surrender. I agree that this will not work without having a Palestinian Gandhi, a Palestinian Mandela, or a Palestinian Martin Luther King. Abbas is none of the above, right? So there, Abbas is not Gandhi, is not Mandela, and is not Martin Luther King. So you need a change of the Palestinian leadership, right, uh, in order to be able to lead this. Now, I was asked this question whether can leadership, you know, adjust, you know, in, in order to be able to lead? Yes, there is always an opportunity, right? If the current Palestinian leadership engages in uh, serious reform, in uh, uh, in uniting the Palestinians, engage in uh, fundamental serious uh, reform within the Palestinian society, and most importantly, gain the trust of the Palestinians. The current Palestinian leadership is not trusted by the Palestinian society. And that is why 
we we are unable to produce the popular resistance model that uh, that Tariq also mentioned because and i agree this is the second part of your question and as i said with you know joseph knight defining the limitations of uh, soft power that by itself or soft power only will not work it will not work with in palestine it will not work anywhere right and that's why the soft power needs to be supported by the popular resistance and the current leadership is unable to lead in a popular resistance because they have to have the trust of the palestinian society which they don't have and unless they engage in deep reform and deep changes and changing of you know this leadership you know, the youngest in this current leadership is uh, 70 years old right of you know from the old generation of you know thinking about still you know the old way that you're you're, uh, you're leading and you're ruling you need a young leadership to lead a liberating leadership an inspiring leadership charismatic leadership right we don't have a charismatic leadership but then this again back to the uh, discussion of an opportunity this also this presents uh, an opportunity for the Palestinians to in, to look at what they're doing and about their leadership and see the time for change both you know for uh, you know Fatih and Hamas because that what the, the current failure on the level of the Palestinian leadership is not limited to the Palestinian authority in Ramallah it's it's about the Palestinian leadership that I call it in political parties and in the formal structure of the Palestinian Authority. And I think when the Palestinians are able to achieve this, then I can assure you this will be the model or the paradigm moving forward and would be able to change uh, or to address the balance or the imbalance of power that we, uh, Tariq and I agree, are major factors for uh, uh, re resolving or uh, you know liberating the, the Palestinians. Uh, I'm glad that Tariq disagrees with me on one thing, you know, on the uh, on the force. I I stick to my position, Tariq. Whether the Palestinian will be for, uh, forced to accept, you might be right, right? And, but I, I just don't I, see how the Palestinians, through force, they're going to accept the deal of the century. But again, I, I see your point, and I think you're making a strong point, and I'm glad to hear it that there is a different view. But me, I just don't see how the Palestinian leadership. If if the, if Abbas, right, the most uh, liberal, accommodating leader in the history of Palestine since Bill Ford Declaration, is not accepting this, that right? the Palestinian movement should be replacing or will be replacing with a changing Abbas or Abbas passing away or whatever in the current leadership, this will leadership will be replaced by a more inspiring. Right, serious leadership for the Palestinians, not less than, not going lower than the level that Abbas is going. But let's see what how things go in the future. Can, you want to respond? So yes, please. Uh, no, no, it's not that I want to respond. I want to add one more point that I think it's a point of disagreement between the two of us, just to keep things interesting. Otherwise, we're too, we're too yeah. aligned. That's uh, true. I, I, di I disagree that we don't have inspiring Palestinian leaders. I think that there are uh, many inspiring Palestinian leaders. I think we're living in a situation where there was a history of assassinations, a history of imprisonment, where now there's an authoritarian rule in, in both the West Bank and in Gaza that, that suppresses the Palestinian leaders. The people are active and they are there and there is popular resistance. I think that we're living under, under a a double if not triple system of oppression and i think that's the structure that we need to understand and break rather than wait for a mandela or a gandhi or or whatever because i do think that those leaders are out there uh just for the record Noor, if you allow me a very uh, short comment actually i'm in total agreement with Tariq on this point so we're not in disagreement <laughs> <laughs> i was referring okay. only to the formal leadership of the palestinian yes. people in ramallah the Palestinian Authority and Hamas leadership and other political parties that are now uh, outdated and uh, like yes. uh, uh, that's just for the record. That's what yeah. I'm referring to. But yeah. I agree with you. There are many, many, many inspiring Palestinian uh, uh, Palestinian leaders that are not in formal positions now, and those can make a difference. And yeah. that's why I think also Palestinians will not accept, you know, for this even by force. Thank you uh, both uh, Tara and Ibrahim um, for your um, 
engaged views on this uh, on this topic. And we at Al Shabaka have published uh, uh, some articles on Palestinian leadership. There's a new policy lab uh, next week on uh, reviving the PLO, and they will be discussing as well um, Palestinian uh, leadership. Um, I'm aware of the time. We have two more minutes, so. Uh, we will not be able to address any of the questions, but there is one question that has two votes, so I want to um, briefly, um, one of you uh, maybe can uh, can answer it. Where does Jared Kushner and the money figure in? What do you think about the role that Jared Kushner has been playing? Um, do you have any idea, Brahim or Tarek? Ibrahim, I leave this to you. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. What is the question again? The question, and I'm quoting, where does Jared Kushner and money figure in? In the sense yeah. of like political yeah, yeah, economy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. I, I see the point. I see the, the question. I think this is the whole deal of the century model is built on this. I mean, you have business, uh, uh, real estate, uh, uh, you know, the people in the White House, Jared Kushner and uh, uh, Donald Trump and uh, a bankruptcy lawyer, David Friedman. And, and this this is a whole business model. Basically, they're thinking about it is that, OK, here's 50 billion dollars and this will fix with well, this will fix the uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, issue uh, and in the, the slogan. And uh, it's sad. It's sad to see people who are in power in a superpower. They're thinking with this level of ignorance, right? Treating the history and the uh, people's identity and belief and dignity and human uh, human suffering, you know, thinking that money can buy this and can solve this. It's, it's unfortunate and sad, right? And it's, I would say it's racist to think that people uh, uh, ig ignoring the dignity and uh, the history and the identity and the suffering of the Palestinians, thinking that they've been suffering for almost a century now or for more than a century, thinking that you presented $25 billion, put it on the table, right through the uh, Bahrain workshop that was held back in June, and thinking this will take care of it. It's a pity. It's, uh, it's about this level of ignorance uh, that I can assure you it will not work. Yes, it will work with the uh, uh, Egyptian regime with Sisi, who's a driven financially, driven, you know, with all his policy in the region, right, is about uh, how to make money, right, basically with Saudi Arabia and take money from the UAE and all of that. Yes, with that, you can give him some money and we'll see this. But I can assure you, regardless of how weak the Palestinians are, they will, their, their land, their dignity, their Jerusalem is not for sale. And uh, Jared Kushner should understand this. And if not, the history will teach him. Thank you so much, Tare and Ibrahim, for all your insights. It was very enriching. And I hope we uh, can have both of you in a new policy lab in, in the future. And for the time being, uh, thank you, everyone, again. Uh, please keep, stay safe, healthy, and, uh, and well. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events, and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.